Well, a very good morning, everybody in Stroud Christian Fellowship from me, Gary Bastin, and all of us here at Hope Community Church in Basingstoke. So I'm here locked down at home with my wife, Marianne, and our three adult kids who seem to be eating us out of house and home at the moment. I know some of you, but I don't know all of you. Maybe if you've been to a Salt and Light Summer Transform event, you might have seen me either leading worship or running the Good Morning Transform All Age Morning Gatherings. Well, I hope you are adjusting to this new normal. As Mr. Spock in Star Trek would say, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. You know, I'm very grateful for technology like this where we can stay connected. And I've been doing a lot of zooming around at the moment, and maybe you have too. But I never thought that my wheelie bin would go out more than I do in 2020. We may be quarantined, but God is still at work. We may be in lockdown, but our worship of the living God is not locked down. So what a great time for us to be considering worship in lockdown at this time. So thank you, Martin, for the invitation. I would have loved to have been with you, but today we're going to connect in this way. Now, I have seen what Martin, Kim and Rob have done, and it's really good stuff. If you haven't seen it, I would suggest you do have a look at it on YouTube. But I've got a few thoughts I just want to add in the mix. So let's pray together. Father, I pray that today, that what I have to say would help people. It would connect with them, resonate with them, and lead them into new depths of worship. For your glory. Amen. You know, worship is in the DNA of every human. It's everywhere. Just think of stadiums, theatres, cinemas. People are going to worship. If you were to take a photograph of a fans um, cheering on their favourite football team, or those maybe at rock or pop concert, their arms are in the air, they're singing along, they are worshipping those on the pitch or those on the stage. We love our celebrities, don't we? But you know, worship isn't just in those arenas. Worship can be closer to home. Literally, some people worship their house or worship their garden, their car, their pet, or maybe their kids, or maybe even themselves. You see, worship is in our DNA. Everybody worships. The question is, what is it you are worshiping? You know, as Christians, we are called first and foremost to worship God. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 says, you shall have no other gods before me. As God was forming his people Israel, right there at the heart of the commandments, was putting God first and foremost. I know a few weeks ago, Martin spoke from Psalm 46, and it says, be still and know that I am God. So knowing who God is. You know, if we are to worship God, then it's good to know who he is. What is he like? So how do we find out? Well, we look here, don't we? We go to the Bible because this library of books paints a picture of the character and nature of the Godhead, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Have you ever done a study of the character and nature of God? Well, here's a little challenge for you. Why don't you do a, a little study? Look into it. Go online and Google something like the names of God. I've got a few here just to kind of whet your appetite. Some from the Old and some from the New Testament. Have you ever heard of this, the name Adonai? It means Lord and Master. Or how about Elohim, the everlasting God? Or Jehovah Jireh? The Lord will provide. Maybe you know this one, Jehovah Ra, which is the Lord is my shepherd. We get that in Psalm 23. You think about it, David, before he became king, he was a shepherd. Do you remember in the Bible when he faced Goliath, he said to Saul, Look, I've killed a lion, I've killed a bear to protect my sheep. So what he did there naturally, he then could see, actually, that's how God was treating him. There are some fantastic names that describe God in the Old Testament. Well, think about the New Testament. What are the names are there for Jesus? There was Christ, uh, Messiah, the Chosen One. Think about John's Gospel, where Jesus talks about the I Ams. I am the gate. I am the bread of life. I am the way and the truth and the life. 
let me encourage you to look into these names of God. Think about why they were written. What was the context in which they were first used in the Bible? And what do they mean for you today? Meditate on them. Pray on them. If you're a creative person, maybe you could write some prose or a poem. If you're a songwriter, write a song. If you're an artist, you could paint a picture about them. Knowing these names of God will help you in your worship. The second area I just want to touch on is thankfulness. And I know that Rog mentioned it last week. But, you know, the doorway into worship is gratitude. Psalm 95 begins, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and with music and song. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise him. So what do we give thanks to God for? Well, as I've just said, those names of God, if you look into those, they will give you fuel for your worship. Well, how about the everyday things around us? Last year, 2019, I was getting ready for our Good Friday service. And as I was getting dressed, something happened, something popped in my back. I soon discovered that I had slipped a disc. And if that has ever happened to you, you will know the kind of pain I was in. For the first few days, I couldn't get out of bed. I had to crawl uh, to the bathroom. I had to use crutches around the house. There was a lot of pain. I spent weeks at home. In fact, it was a form of self-isolation I went through for weeks. I didn't make it to a Sunday gathering for months. And when I did, I just sort of sat at the back and wept. But whilst I was in this pain, I was determined to kind of keep my faith sharp. And one of the ways of doing that was through gratitude. It was through looking at the things that were very close to hand and giving thanks to God. I remember thanking God for the bed that I was in. I remember thanking God that I could go to the toilet and there'd be flushing water there. It was those small things, but that was fueling Thanksgiving. And you know, there's been a lot of research these days into well-being. And we hear that, don't we, on the news about our well-being. See, giving thanks isn't just for us as Christians. It's for everyone. Ah. I thought I'd lost my notes there, but they're stuck together. So current research tells us this. Gratitude is a natural antidepressant. When we express gratitude, our brains release certain chemicals that make us feel good. And there is a strong connection between gratitude and good health. Isn't that just like God, the creator, to make us in this way? By giving thanks for things and to other people, it actually does us good as well. So let us learn to give thanks in the moment. I remember talking to somebody in our church just recently. They were getting frustrated as they were lining up to go around a supermarket. And then they were thinking, no, I need to focus here. And they were just giving thanks to God. There's a lot of anxiety around at the moment. And Philippians 4 verse 6, Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Yes, he understood that we can get anxious, but the antidote to do that is giving thanks. So let me encourage you to be a people of thanksgiving. Joyce Myers, uh, the American TV preacher and uh, writer, she says this, think less and thank more. I'll say that again, think less and thank more cultivate a heart of thanksgiving that's the heart of a worshiper again how can you do that creatively maybe you could start a thanksgiving journal just jotting down things that you're thankful to god for or how about a thanksgiving jar a thankful jar maybe for yourself or if you're there with family you could write down the little things that you're thankful for and pop them in the jar and at the end of a week or every couple of weeks, you can open up the jar and see the things that you are thankful to God for. My final thing is this, perspective. Uh, in an interview with Bono, the lead singer of U2, he was asked this, what is the one thing that he could not live without? This wealthy, successful rock star thought, and he answered, perspective. 
I agree with him. You know, our perspective actually affects how we live. And as worshippers, we need to have God's perspective on things. Think about the Lord's Prayer. What does it say? You know, your kingdom come, your will be done. We're trying to align ourselves with the one we are worshipping, with God himself. Now, at this time, I appreciate it can be hard. We may be struggling to just accept or to navigate through what's going on because we don't have a framework. We don't have a grid for this. In my life, I've never faced a global pandemic before. But, you know, things like this have happened in history before. You might have heard of this poem that's been going around on the Internet. Somebody sent it to me. It was written in 1869 and reprinted during a pandemic in 1919, so about 100 years ago. So listen to the words of this poem. I don't know who wrote it, but these words almost could have been written very recently. And people stayed at home and read books and listened and they rested and did exercises and made art and played and learned new ways of being and stopped and listened more deeply. Someone meditated, someone prayed, someone met their shadow and people began to think differently and people healed. And in the absence of people who lived in ignorant ways, dangerous, meaningless and heartless, the earth also began to heal. And when the danger ended and people found themselves, they grieved for the dead and made new choices and dreamed of new visions and created new ways of living and completely healed the earth just as they were healed. I like that. I like how it affects not just people, but the earth. Remember, Psalm 24 tells us the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Have you heard of these stories around the world of octopus being seen in the river streets of Venice or smog lifting over uh, capital cities and particularly New Delhi? The earth is breathing again. We need to take heed from Psalm 61 where it says, God, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. As worshippers, we need God's perspective on this. I'd like to uh, read from Romans 8. Well, actually, I'm not going to do it. My daughter, Abby's going to read it. This is from the Apostle Paul. Here's a guy who knew hard times. Here's a guy who was thrown into prison and beaten and shipwrecked and whipped, all because of his faith. If you know Paul, when he was in prison, he worshipped. And I think this text, which will be Romans 8, 18 to 28, captures come, kind of where we're at. It, it captures our present state. It captures hope, God's creation, help from the Holy Spirit, and ultimately God's purpose in this. So let's listen to Abby read, and then I'll come back and conclude. Thanks, Abby. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. 
And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Wonderful. Let me encourage you just to reread Romans 8, 18 to 28 in your own time. Just reflect on what God might be saying to you. So thank you for letting me speak to you this morning. Three things. Let's remember who is centre stage. Discover or rediscover who God is. Fall in love with him again. Secondly, let's be thankful. It's the gateway of worship and it is good for our well-being. And finally, may you and I keep a godly perspective on what is going on in his world. God bless you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day. Goodbye.